legal custodian of the Holy Al Abbas Shrine, His Eminence, Sayyid Ahmed Al Safi, may Allah protect his glory. Secretary General of Holy Al Abbas Shrine, Mustafa Al Dia Al Din, may Allah protect his success. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished researchers, participants, presenters, guests, and audience in this hall and those joining us all around the world online. You are kindly welcomed to the Second Imamat, Second International Imamat Seven Days Conference held under the slogan Prophethood and Imamat, Two Single Rooted Palm Trees Beyond Chasm, which aims to shed light on the teaching of Imams to educate individual and nation and explore significant contemporary issues according to the literature and legacy of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. We begin the opening ceremony of the conference with a recitation from the glorious Quran. So let us hearken to Allah's words delivered to us by the reciter Ammar al Hilli. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ ابتلى إبراهيم ربه بكلمات فأتمهن قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما قال ومن ذريتي قال لا ينال عهدي الظالمين وإذ ابتلى إبراهيم رب بكلمات فأتمهن قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما قال ومن ذريتي قال لا ينال عهد وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنًا وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ 
واهدنا إلى إبراهيم وإسماعيل واهدنا طائفين والعاكفين والركع السجود صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد For those who sacrificed themselves and earned immortal martyrdom to shield honor, faith, land, and man, you are kindly requested to stand up for the recitation of Al Fatiha Surat. Would you please remain standing in respect to Al-Iba altruism anthem and share moments of reverence and unity while it is being played? أبى الفضل يا فارس الليالي تذل المنايا ولا تستكي فأنت الحسام وأنت اللواء وأنت الثبات وأنت الإباء فأنت الحسام وأنت اللواء وأنت الثبات جيش الفداء للحسين وقد كنت جيش الفداء للحسين Thank you so much. Now we listen to a word for the preparatory committee delivered by Professor Dr. Haydar al -Musawi. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين We are in the age of formula We are in the age of facts We are in the age of numbers But 
In the terrain of Ahlul Bayt, there is no formula. There is no number. There is no ground facts as they are beyond such formulas. Trust logic, trust heart, trust facts. Man trusts them all to spend a day. Nowadays, science evolves and booms. Innovative methods spread. Spaceships orbit the sun along with the earth. Intercontinental missiles set all the words vulnerable to their range and to name just a few. We are in a press button age. It's the age of AI. Everything possible. With Karbala and Hussein, the formula takes hold of one fact. Trust your faith, not AI, nor astrological mind could be found in such divine formula. None dare unknow the puzzle, the miracle lady Zainab alayhi salam in Levant a verse. Very die, prove and do your resolve. Very die, thy she can really. Verily do thy be essence by Allah. Neither da trounce our mention, nor deprive us of our doctrines. Does it its ignominy abandon you forever? For thy view is nothing but refutation. For thy days are nothing but limitation. For thy throng is nothing but emaciation. In a day the herald shouts and dispatches his cares. And this is the real and the ground formula in life. Nowadays all these words come true. Hussein, a man, sacrifices for everything, for faith and Islam. Hussein gives birth to a city and nation. Hussein tends to be an identity. And this is the great formula in life. Do you imagine someone creating a city, repute, identity in one time? When you belong to yourself, when you appertain to yourself, it means you pertain to Hussein. When you are lost and you are crouching for light to be guided, you will find Hussein as moral, mentor, paragon, and a model figure. Hussein and his baby are blind to be buried, hidden, concealed, but they sprout from sand, rocks, and different machinations. Karbala designates Hussein and all the shrines a blood for faith. For the city and for the entire world, Hussein grants believers an identity, a pathway to dignity and freedom, to the freedom fighters worldwide. His Eminence Sayyid Ahmed Safi, the legal custodian of Holy Abbas Shrine, the Reverend Secretary General Sayyid Mustafa Dia ad distinguished researchers, academics, delegates from Canada, Sweden, Germany, Iran, Pakistan, Lebanon. A very good morning to you all. Ladies, gentlemen, you are all most welcome on the land of benevolence. Dearest professors nationwide, worldwide, to have the platform of truth and authenticity. First, may I thank each of our speakers for taking part in this event. The quality and the caliber of the speakers. This version is so marvelous as the conference statistics shows some data. 
31 papers received, 19 papers accepted, 12 papers and abstract rejected, two of them withdrawn for having Iraq classed as red zone. Here lurks one of the main mission of Hul Abbas Shrine. To invite academics to fathom the reality of the educational and scientific projects the shrine does. In time, media converts, in time, media invents, in time, media it twists the truth, in time, the holy shrines doing their best to keep in parallel with, with life. To fathom reality of the educational and the scientific projects, the shrine does in the face of all challenges. Universal learning from kindergarten through primary and secondary level to tertiary education with high scale of infrastructure, teaching staff members, all the Westerners who attended the conference felt at home after some minutes of their arrival. The truths reality. Welcome to you all, the truth seekers on the land of philanthropy and altruism, the land of the first quencha, Imam al-Abbas, the first quencha, and the standard bearer. By thy own hand, thou spit no water. Though Euphrates bends the knee to you, to aver that thy mention and repute never abate, far, far from them to fade. They are all our standard perils, dawn by dusk. Thank you very much and have wonderful and blessed time ahead, inshallah. Femal. Now it is time to begin the first academic session, the morning session, and I kindly invite Professor Dr. Abbas Hassan Jassim from Kufa University and Professor Dr. Jassim Khalifa from Basra University to convene the session. Doctors, you are both welcome to approach the stage. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم لك الحمد دائما مع دوامك ولك الحمد باقيا مع بقائك ولك الحمد خالدا مع قلودك ولك الحمد كما ينبغي لكرم وجهك وعز جلالك هذا الجلال والإكرام صلوات الله وصلوات ملائكة وأنبيائه ورسله وجميع خلقه على محمد وأهل بيت محمد والسلام عليه وعليهم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear esteemed speakers attendees, good morning and assalamu alaikum. Yasurani bismi wa bismikum ala taqaddam bittahniya li maqami sahib al-asr wa al-zaman al-imam al-muntabar ajallallahu farajahu al-sharif wa ila muraji'na al-idham dama dhallahum al-warf wa ila jami' al-mu'minin bi munasabat Eid Allah al-Akbar Eid al-Ghadir al-Aghar wa hanniukum ayyuha al-sayyidat wa al-sada al-hudur bihada al-Eid a'adahu Allah ta'ala ala jami' bil-khayr wal-baraka والثبات على الولاية ولاية أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام. Many happy returns of the occasion of Eid al-Ghadir. I would like to offer my heartfelt talk thanks to Al-Abbas Holy Shrine for holding this important talk at conference on prophethood and imama and their oneness, <coughs> unity and integrity. A special note of gratitude to my friend and colleague Professor Dr. Hayd al-Ghazi and I'm Dr. Abbas, Professor of Linguistics at the University of Kufa. <clears throat> I'm both honored and delighted to be the chairperson of this talk session. And this is my colleague, Dr. Jasim Khalifa Sultan, the Professor of uh, Translation at the University of Basra. He will be the convener of the session. Dear speakers and attendees, 
I would like to welcome you all and thank you for your participation in this conference, the second international Imam at Oke conference, which will be on the Shia 12 verse Imam's teachings of individuals, to individuals and nations. Special thanks to speakers from Sweden, Germany, Pakistan, Iran, Canada, Lebanon maybe, and from different Iraqi cities who painstakingly joined us today. I hope I had this conference uh, effectively to ensure a smooth facilitation and engagement. I'll try to keep track of time to ensure that each speaker has their allotted okay time and the session stays on schedule. Dr. Khalifa and I will signal to the speakers when they have, okay, you know, a few minutes remaining. 10 minutes will be given for each to each presentation. And after the end of the session, we'll have, you will have the opportunity to have your questions. Um, dear professors, this session is very rich in topics. We have 10 papers. They talk about the lifestyle, thoughts, speeches, and debates of Shia Imams, and it will bring together presentations on various linguistic, psychological, and sociological aspects of Shia Imams' lives, daily behavior, their relations to the state, their effects on people in the past, the present, the place where they live, and elsewhere. Additionally, the session will shed light on Imams' curriculum and their roles in teaching standards to individuals and nations, Remarkably, uh, there is a magnificent linguistic and stylistic analysis of their speeches, command, commandments, uh, teachings, and OK debates. Both remarkably and interestingly, the translation of purification verse, Ayat al tathir the purification, purification of Ahl al-Bayt is also vitally investigated. The next session will be after an OK session at OK maybe 4 p.m. We'll introduce more presentations on the linguistic and stylistic aspects of the speech and teach teachings of various imams. Welcome again. Our first OK presentation is, will be by uh, Professor Oliver um, Sharbrod, Lund University, Sweden. He's going to talk about two different types of interrelationships and maybe strategies or styles um, demonstrated by Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein uh, towards okay, the state at that time then. And thank you, please. The ground is yours, okay, to introduce okay, the researcher, please. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear audience, we are very delighted to have you today in uh, this uh, very uh, rich uh, day, rich with information about uh, Ahl al-Bayt and their uh, thinking. Uh, the first speaker, as Mr. Chairman has uh, mentioned, uh, has just mentioned, is Professor Dr. Uh, Dr. Farid uh, al-Hindawi. He is a, a professor, an emerit, and a PhD holder, and uh, he holds uh, a BA in uh, English language from, uh, and literature from Al-Mustansariya University, and uh, a master's also in applied linguistics from Edinburgh University from the United Kingdom, published more than 170 uh, research papers, published more than 12 books in linguistics and pragmatics, supervised uh, more than 30 dissertations and theses, uh, as well as uh, examined more than 50 uh, theses and uh, uh, dissertations as uh, chairman of the examining committee. Uh, our the the co-author is uh, uh, with Dr. Farid is Dr. Maha Muhammad. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the Department of English College of uh, Languages, University of Kufa. She holds a PhD in English. Language and Linguistics from the College of Education for Human Sciences, University of Babylon in Iraq. She is interested in cognitive, linguistic, critical pragmatics and discourse analysis. In addition to several national and international publications in her name, she has also supervised many undergraduate research paper. So our researchers would talk about 
something related to language, which is uh, the, the paper is entitled A Rhetorical Discourse Analysis of Dignity uh, in Imam al sajjads Damascus Speeches. So please. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Dr. Maha al Mohammed, and um, today I will be presenting a co-authored paper with my um, esteemed professor and mentor, Dr. Fareed al-Hindawi. Unfortunately, uh, he is suffering a bit of a health crisis, so he will not be able to join me on stage, but inshallah, I will do our research. Inshallah, good. Okay. So um, our paper uh, is by the title, A Rhetorical Discourse Analysis of Dignity in Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam's Damascus speech. Uh, so uh, due to time restrictions, I'll be limiting uh, the presentation to a few points. Uh, I'll be presenting a brief introduction, and then I'll move on to the concept of dignity. We'll look at the etymology, the, a few definitions, and maybe some related concepts. And then I'm going to move on to the uh, approach we will be adopting in the study, and that is rhetorical discourse analysis. Um, also, I'll present the model, um, uh, the eclectic, the five-stage eclectic model we have adopted. Uh, we'll also look at some of the findings and conclusions, and then uh, we'll move on to some of the references we have adopted. So uh, starting off with the introduction, uh, the speech delivered by Imam uh, As-Sajjad Ali bin al-Hussein alayhi salam in Damascus is considered a prominent historical event and a highly rhetorical speech that reflects the courage and steadfastness of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam in the face of injustice and tyranny. It's, it demonstrated as Sajjad's dignity, familial pride, courage, and dedication to exposing the truth, combining a steadfast power of expression, precision in choice, and emotional impact. The speech is basically considered a hallmark in Islamic rhetoric. Um, uh, I'll be stating some of the aims uh, of the study, since the study focuses on the rhetorical discursive strate strategies underpinning Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam's va valiant uh, Damascus speech. The purpose of our study uh, is basically to analyze the rhetorical effectiveness of the speech in order to un undercover underlying persuasive intentions, identity patterns, sorry, identify patterns and evaluate the efficiency, the efficiency of discursal strategies. Um, basically, the, the thorough examination and interpretation of the, these persuasive techniques which are used in the speech aims to highlight the importance and profound impact of Al-Sajjad's argumentation strategies and the influence of his discourse choices in turning the audience around and in his favor. Accordingly, uh, we have set the following research questions. And uh, since we have adopted Van uh, Den Hoven's 2005 theory of rhetorical discourse analysis, uh, we have a twofold aim, and that is basically uh, looking at the rhetorical devices on one, on one hand and then analyzing the discursive strategies on the other hand. And uh, therefore, we put forth uh, three uh, research questions. Number one, what are the rhetorical devices underlying Al-Sajjad alayhi salam's persuasive intentions? So we're going to uh, deal with rhetorical devices and figurative language and analyze that. Number two, how is the maintenance of dignity and uh, familial pride rhetorically effective in conveying uh, the imam's argument. And the notion that we focus on basically in our paper is the notion of dignity. Okay, so we're gonna ask about dignity and how is it um, effective or rhetorically effective uh, in the paper. Finally, our last question is, what are the discourse strategies and linguistic devices governing the communicative purpose of the speech? Uh, so as I said, uh, the basic notion uh, we are dealing with is dignity. So some of you may ask, what is dignity? Uh, we have translated it in Arabic to kalimat uh, at-tafakhur. Okay. Uh, some of you may be questioning uh, the connotation of the word itself, whether it holds uh, a negative connotation. But in fact, it has been used uh, positively in the speech, and we're going to uh, emphasize that. So the sermon basically delivered... Um, um, in it, uh, Imam Sajjal asserted his uh, image 
with a great, sorry, his lineage, his family and his lineage with great dignity. And he starts off by saying, I am the son of Mecca and Mina. I am the son of Zamzam and Safa. I am the son of the Prophet of Allah. So basically, uh, right from the beginning, his words resonated deeply as he proudly introduced and described his family members in order to familiarize the audience with, um, with their grand status. So what is dignity? Um, uh, etymologically, we have traced the word to Latin, and it comes from the word uh, dignitas, which is derived, and it means basically worthy or deserving. And as a f uh, the fundamental concept underlying dignity is the quality or the state of being worthy of honor respect and esteem. So these three key notions are what we are building um, uh, our concept around. Um, also, um, when we speak of dignity, we basically refer to the inherent value and respectability that a person or thing possesses. However, we know that the concept itself may be related with other concepts. And um, for one, you know, to be honest, at the beginning, we, we translated the word tafakhr into pride, and then we retracted, uh, and then we, uh, we, we swapped it around with the word dignity, right? Diktor Farid, we had a discussion about that, uh, whether to translate tafakhr into pride or dignity, and then we settled on dignity uh, um, because of uh, the research we had conducted, and uh, it's much more closer to... Um, the speech. Um, moving on to RDA, and that's basically an acronym for Rhetorical Discourse Analysis. Some of you may wonder what is Rhetorical Discourse Analysis. It's basically a method of examining and interpreting language in communication with the aim of understanding how persuasive techniques, argumentation strategies, and linguistic choices influence meaning and impact a target audience. Generally, RDA brings together methods and theories uh, from strands of discourse analysis. So it's basically a combination of discourse analysis, classical rhetoric, and rhetorical analysis. An amalgamation of all three approaches um, uh, gives us RDA. And if you are wondering why, it's basically because all three share in common... Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. So can you move okay. to... I'll, I'll move on quicker. Okay, so I'll skip this part, but, but you have a clear image of what RDA is now. Um, uh, so basically the theory or the model I have ad uh, adopted uh, is based on four uh, main devices. I will not go into details, but they talk about number one, uh, there being a narration. And this is present in uh, the speech or Imam al-Sajjad's speech. He narrates. And then we have a comparison where he compares okay, his words to what has been said before him by uh, the person that has been allocated by Yazid. And then we have argumentation in Arabic, al-Hijaj. And that's basically the heart of rhetoric. And then we have contextual framing and how he was able uh, to approach a situation from a limited network and flip the tables around and gain uh, his audience. Uh, before you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is our model of analysis. Uh, if you can see, it is a five-stage uh, model um, and it's built on uh, the starting off with the contextual analysis, moving on to identifying the rhetorical strategies, and then the discursive strategies. And then, as I said, we incorporate the, um, uh, the, mo um, the model I have ad ad adopted, the narration, comparison, argumentation, and contextual framing. And finally, right at the end, we seek to understand the functions behind uh, 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 their use. Okay, um, we're going to skip now to some of the main findings. And um, basically, what I have noticed, is, uh, or what we have noticed in our research, is the way uh, Al Imam uh, Al Sajjad alayhi salam introduces okay, his lineage, his family. And, and the thing about it is that he, he introduces them both uh, figuratively and literally, and he introduces them uh, from or through their accomplishments. And um, and, 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 and in that way, this strengthens his credibility and reminds people of his noble lineage. 
Also, we notice in the speech the use of uh, the, there's a Quranic approach. Uh, so basically, uh, we have an intertextual approach. He makes use of some of the uh, verses from the Quran, hadiths. He also makes use of the adhan itself. Right at the end of the speech, when the mu'adhan um, Yazid tries to stop the speech and the mu'adhan starts and he says, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, I hereby testify that Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah. He uses this part um, um, as the gist of his argument right at the end, and he asks a rhetorical question. So we see that intertextuality. We also, we also note uh, from the analysis the emotional signals uh, that have been uh, used by a sajjad alayhi salam. So he appeals to logos and ethos to rise those emotions uh, in his audience right at the end uh, or right somewhere in throughout the speech, he says, I think this is enough to um, make anyone cry. And this is exactly what happened to his audience. Um, he was able to introduce his uh, father and grandfather uh, through uh, characterizing their accomplishments. Also, um, I'm going to go through two of the main conclusions. I won't go into details. So um, we have concluded that the approach adopted, adopted by Imam al-Sajjad uh, is an emotional one. And this is why we say he appeals to rhetoric in order to awake the hearts of those brainwashed by the Umayyad propaganda, propaganda sorry, against Ahlul Bayt salam. Moreover, he appealed to truthfulness and factual events and logic, and this is where Logos kicks in, to awaken the hearts and minds of his audience and with the overall aim of raising the voice of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, because as you know, this speech was the aftermath of the Battle of Karbala. So he was kind of reviving the battle and reviving those, um, those emotions in, in the audience. Um, these are some of the references that we have, uh, um, we have used in our research, and uh, basically the last one is the most important one, the one we have uh, based our model upon, and that's Van den Hoven, 2005, The Art of Retrical Discourse Analysis. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Had uh, Maha, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Hindawi. We wish uh, Professor Hindawi a quick recovery of his health. The third uh, presentation will be by Dr. Marcus Mehdi Gerhardt from Germany. It is entitled uh, The Position of Different Cultures and Customs of People in the Lifestyle and Thoughts of Imam Ali and His Connection to Daily Life of Muslims in Europe. Uh, we ask uh, Professor Marcus Oke okay, to. Dr. Marcus uh, is. Uh... German by birth, but the most interesting uh, turning point uh, in his life, uh, he has converted from Catholic Christ Christianity into Islam in 1989. Uh, he is a researcher, a translator, uh, an author, uh, uh, cooperated with uh, many uh, NGOs, uh, governmental and then governmental institutions. If you'd like, it's up there. Okay. Yeah. And he's uh, participating in a, a translation project about uh, the Holy uh, Quran. Nowadays, he's in cooperation with the Institute of Islamic Pedagogy in North Rhine, West Anglia, in German. So, welcome, Doctor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As-salatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa sayyid al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tayyabina al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sada al-ulama wal-bahithun. Ikhwati wa akhawati. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful gathering to know each other, ta'aruf, and to hear uh, very nice speeches about different subjects. I will speak about Imam Ali, alayhi salam, and his connection 
to people and his uh, attitude towards uh, different cultures and thoughts. When the researcher who loves wisdom and knowledge reads the words and statements of Imam Ali alayhi salam, especially in the wonderful book of Nahjul Balagha, collection of speeches, letters, and short words of the Imam, he will find many points and discussions about the social coexistence and building this life lived together in peace and happiness in the light and on the base of the real values of Islam in the style of Prophet's household, peace be upon them. Times and situations exist in the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam in which Muslims approve wars, battles, and conflicts between themselves. How did the Imam face oppositions, enemies, friends, and companions? And how was his behavior towards them? At which periods does mankind need toler tolerance and peaceful behavior? more than harshness, and where are the borders of this tolerance? How was the op opinion of Imam Ali alayhi salam about the different cultures, customs, and religions in the time of expanding Islam from the Hinduist and Buddhist East to the Christian West in Anatolia, Syria, and Egypt? How did Imam Ali alayhi salam open doors for dialogue and a peaceful social life? These questions are related to Muslims' life in Germany and Europe, who need practical methods for continuing their life with happiness and success. As a responsible person for training Muslim teachers for Islamic education in public schools and colleges <clears throat> in, Ge in Germany, and also as somebody who is in touch with young, young students and pupils, it is an interest, an interest for me how we can use Imam Ali's attitude towards social and educational affairs and how we can manage cultural, cultural and religious differences in education in a secular country like Germany. This question leads me to the following headlines. How faced Imam Ali alayhi salam people? Imam Ali's opinion about human rights and different cultures and religions. The place of cultures, customs in political practice and views of Imam Ali and Imam Ali and his attitude towards power. When we have a research in different statements, letters, and speeches of Imam Ali, we see that the Imam regarded every human being as equal. He avoided to make differences between believers of religions or members of various nations because in his system of thought, mankind is equal in front of the Creator. This method of ruling and interacting with individuals has, was very new in the ancient ages, when only the membership in a tribe or religion was a guarantee to be safe and to stay alive. For example, in the pre-Islamic Arabic society, tribe, clan, and family were everything. Without having connections to a well-known tribe, Man couldn't live freely and in security. Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, like Bilal or Salman al-Farsi, are very good ex examples for people without connections to a strong protector or tribe. And now, after periods of oppression and revival of old Arab values, which had to be removed but came out again after the death of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, a man and ruler like Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, begins his rule with the opinion that his reign is not more worth than an old leather shoe when he could not change injustice into justice, 
and help people. This attitude towards power and engagement for people is something that is even not achieved in so-named modern democratic societies. Imam Ali's style of ruling is, in my opinion, a mixture of recognizing realities and the aim <clears throat> to change unjust realities with the guidance of mercy, empathy for each member of the society. Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others are equal in the eye of Ali's justice and politics. In modern politics, we can see everywhere the lack of such an ethical approach to power, society, and those who have to be ruled. Nowadays, and it was the same in old days, political decisions are the result of power calculations and leading factors like economy, military power, and contracts. For Imam Ali, salam, his personal relationship with ordinary people is the key to success and not political power. Following this policy, Imam Ali, salam, elected always personalities as governor for different parts of the Islamic State he could trust fully. The Imam always chose uh, persons like Malik al-Ashtar. In general, it can be said that respectfulness towards every cultural or eth uh, ethnic and also religious origin is the main axis in social politics and government of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Following the footsteps of the great Imam in various sources, I want to compare his approach in my uh, speech and after this in my article to uh, um, existing models nowadays in modern society and to see which approach of the Imam can lead us to a new style of ruling and organizing society. How can thoughts and models of Imam Ali be used in modern education? I would like to start this part of my speech with a story that happened in the time of Omar ibn al-Khattab's rulership. It is mentioned in the most important book of the great Lebanese author, George Jordak, named Imam Ali, the voice of human justice, Sawt al-Adalat al-Insaniyya, he writes in the introduction to one of the chapters in the fourth volume, somebody claimed in a subject, Imam Ali, in front of the caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Umar <clears throat> invited both to his court and said to uh, Imam Ali, stand next to this man. Imam Ali seemed to be angry. And Omar asked him, are you upset because you have to stand beside your enemy? Imam Ali salam, answered, never. But you treat me with respect and say to me, Ya Abul Hassan, and don't behave the same way with him. In another incident, Imam Ali salam, was sitting on the top of a horse and some people followed him. He addressed them and asked, why do you follow me? Do you have anything to do with me? They said, nothing. He answered, so don't follow me, because following a rider um, destroys him and humiliates the followers. In these two incidents, some very important points about Imam Ali's attitude towards people and human rights are shown clearly. The Imam had a deep understanding of equality. He is one of the most important personalities of Islam, the husband of the Prophet's daughter. He will become the, become the fourth caliph of all Muslims, and he is the first imam of Shiites, and one of the most educated persons in wisdom and belief. But when it comes to rights and interactions with other human beings or legal affairs, he wants to be equal with others. It is not important for Imam Ali salam, if the claimer is right or not. From which origin or branch of the society he comes, he wants even for his enemy a respectful behavior because in front of the law only the truth is important 
and not the origin in other aspects or other aspects. He is not upset because of standing next to a normal man because he regards himself a creation of God and human being in front of the law. The second incident has the same message. Imam Ali doesn't want to have followers like kings or rulers, pharaoh and so on. He wants supporters who decide freely to follow him, to follow the real values of Islam. His aim is to educate conscious human beings who are confident. In this view, values and the truth are more important than persons. It was the wrong decision at the beginning, beginning of Islam and after the uh, passing away of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, and it is the same wrong way in Muslim societies and communities to follow only emotions without wisdom and consciousness. In the time of the first generation of Muslims and after the death of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, People gathered to elect the caliph and ruler, but their scale and values were not clear to find the right person for this very sensitive task. At the end, people returned to what they knew. It was to elect the old respected person, which was assumed to be the right person with much, much experience to lead people to the true path. Thank you, Dr. Marcus. Are there any Uh, yes. Uh, let's say other yes. important points that you want to mention. Yes, of course. In the last two minutes. I will, uh, yes. Thank you. Very short. Sure. Um, and this is the beginning of um, a, a big mistake um, because people couldn't find the right person. As somebody was elected who had not the, the values and the scale uh, of Imam Ali. What I want to say and you can read it after in, in the article, is we are in, ye, in need in Muslim societies and on, uh, also in Western societies of these thoughts of Imam Ali and the A'imma in the fact of uh, justice, equality, uh, democratic approach to everything, to ask people what they want. And that is what we see in the seerah, in the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam and uh, the household of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Wa ashkurkum ma tahiyyati wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, informative work presentation. Now okay, we ask assistant lecturer Batul Zahra Murtaba Ali to okay, come to the platform She will talk about imams, the imam's curriculum in educating the individual and the nation. You are most welcome. Um, my name is Batul Zahra and I'm from Pakistan. Um, I'm right now studying in Karbala. Um, and uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, the team of Al Abbas Holy Shrine for uh, giving, giving us uh, the chance to write for Islam and Ahlul Bayt salam. And re regarding my research, uh, I have chosen the topic uh, about Imam Sajjad salam, uh, about the life of Imam Sajjad salam, and the topic was uh, the uh, curriculum of Imam in educating the individual and the nation. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, in the time period of Imam Sajjad al-Islam, the Imam uh, had faced uh, a number of difficulties and hardships uh, after the incident of Ashura. And uh, that time, um, after the incident of Ashura, uh, after that, after the Karbala movement, the incident of uh, Hara and Um, number of uh, various uh, difficulties uh, which Imam had faced, and due to these problems, the uh, due to these hardships and all that, uh, the beliefs and uh, faiths of people not only just weakened, but uh, many of them were distracted from the uh, 
religion from the right path, and many of them had left the religion. So uh, Imam, uh, Imam Sajjad salam, with his profound wisdom, Imam has started uh, a secret mission um, in order to strengthen the faiths and beliefs of people in their minds, in their hearts, in their souls, uh, in, a, in order uh, uh, and to uh, and strengthen them uh, for the steadfastness uh, towards the right path. And that secret plan, which Imam has started uh, 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 with his unique supplications, and uh, uh, the most unique and effective supplications, which contain uh, the sublime and compre comprehensive concepts, and for in order to guide uh, the uh, society, the individual and society. And uh, through uh, these supplications, which, uh, which are collected and attributed to the name of uh, Sahifa Sajjadiya, and through these uh, uh, beautiful supplications, the Imam has reformed and trained the society uh, in such a way which, uh, that these supplications led the individual and the society uh, to complete their lives uh, uh, to complete their rights, respecting uh, the uh, that they fulfill uh, the rights of Allah and uh, also the rights of people, both are respected. And uh, the some uh, I will share some words uh, uh, from the supplications of Imam that uh, Imam uh, uh, Sajjad al Islam said. Uh, Allahumma ja'alni min jundik fa inna jundaka humul ghalibun wa ja'alni min hizbik fa inna hizbaka humul muflihun wa ja'alni min awliyaik fa inna awliyaka la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun and uh, the wonderful words of imam the supplications of imam contained uh, all uh, covered all the matters like uh, all religious matters whether related to faiths and beliefs whether related to fic and jurisprudence, whether related to morals and ethics or social matters. And uh, by these supplications, uh, with the, um, uh, the priceless efforts of Imam, uh, uh, the Imam wanted the people to become closer to Almighty Allah in such a way that uh, they uh, uh, that a, uh, a, a spiritual connection should be must be established uh, uh, in their hearts towards uh, their Lord, because uh, we all know that the uh, main purpose uh, main purpose of a human's life is to gain knowledge about the Almighty Allah, uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in order to obey Him in the right way. So. Um, uh, when a person, uh, when, uh, when the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shines in the heart of a person, he becomes obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submitive, submissive to his Lord. Um, because, the, because the obedience and the love are connected to each other. Uh, they are not separable. And how uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran Kareem, um, so uh, the more I'll conclude this, the more a person has a strong belief, the more uh, he is firm in his belief and faith in belief in uh, belief in Allah, uh, in His justice, um, and on the day of judgment, accounting, and all these, the more he is obedient to Allah. So, uh, because, uh, and obedience is the fruit of love. The more he loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he, he, he must be uh, more conscious uh, about uh, wajibat, about muhrimat, about uh, all the uh, necessary things, all the obligations of Islam. And uh, uh, in the last, uh, I, uh, I would like to share uh, the deep uh, loving words of Imam that how uh, Imam wanted 
from uh, us uh, to lead that position uh, and uh, to establish that relationship with Almighty Allah that uh, Imam said in his Dua Toba that, oh, oh Allah, uh, I want, uh, Imam said, oh Allah, forgive me, I, I uh, repent you from uh, everything that contradicts your will. And uh, Imam said, from the, uh, from the thoughts of my heart, from the moments of my eyes, and from the stories of my tongue. And these are the so much uh, loving words. And uh, um, in the last, uh, I would say uh, to that, uh, inshallah, uh, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept uh, this humble effort from us and to uh, enrich us with the wealth of sincerity because um, indeed if a person is sincere in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, then Allah opens uh, for him the doors of eternal success beyond his expectations. Uh, thank you so much for listening and thank you so much once again to Al Abbas Holy Shrine and thanks to all of you. Professor Dr. Ansam Riyab Al Ma'roof from Tikrit University College of Education for Women uh, English Department. She will talk about the glorification and veil celebrating the holy household in the poem Abbas, commander of the Divine Army. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. It's an honor for me today to be here for the second time. In fact, it's the third time to be here, but it is the second time to participate in this conference. I have participated in the first international uh, Imamate uh, Week conference. So uh, I choose a poem, which is well known for everybody, uh, I expect here, Abbas Qaid Jaysh al Ilahi. So it is a very important poem since we are in an age of postmodernism, an age of formula, an age of science and numbers, as my dear colleague Prof. Haider said before. So we need to uh, formulate. Uh, a new formula regarding uh, our identity, religious identity for our young people. In such an age of destruction of the identity of norms and, and values, we need to generalize a model that can be a real model for our young people, as well as a model that helps our old people to keep the belief in the religion. So I find, I found after uh, listening to the poem, Abbas, the commander of the divine army, that it is the best poem to be generalized for our young people. So I try my best to translate it first from Arabic to English then to analyze it, so the methodology I followed in writing my paper is the contextual analysis for the poem. So, in fact, after writing more than 100 paper, I find that this is the best title to have glorification for al Bayt by uh, presenting by uh, Al-Abbas, who is the real model for uh, the young people to follow. So, Abbas Qaid Jaysh al Ilahi, Abbas Malifat Ghair Antibahi, is the best way to give or to express our admiration for Al Abbas as the real Islamic religious identity that follow Al Hussein, Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. So, in this age of postmodernism, we find that glorification as an act of elevating someone beyond the real uh, status to romanticize and mythologize that this personality, 
I think it is the best way to present Al Abbas. Salam. So, since we are here in, uh, in the conference of uh, Al Abbas, uh, the Holy Abbas Shrine, we need to glorify this personality. Why? Because he has, uh, I think, he still has the role of defending Islam by giving us the real model of Islamic identity. So uh, by presenting this uh, poem, which I think that it doesn't have uh, enough study since it is written in uh, a colloquial language, not in Arabic language. So I think it needs to uh, be highlighted by someone. And I think it is our role as educated people, as academic personalities, to uh, give light, enough light to these uh, poems. Why? Because we have the role not only in uh, giving light to, uh, light to uh, academic works, but to give education to our young people. Why? Because this is our, uh, let's say, our, our mission as Muslim persons, not only as academic persons. So, I myself uh, translated the poem and uh, analyzed the poem, and I can give you an uh, example of one example for one if I have enough time. Uh, just to, uh, to say how I have uh, analyzed the poem. The first part of the poem glorifies Abbas, the leader uh, of the divine army, using several poetic and rhetorical elements such as uh, epithets and honorifics. The leader of the divine army. This established Abbas' exalted position and divine mandate. The gentlest of God. This statement uh, emphasizes his closeness to the divine and his gentle, compassionate nature. Another point is, is uh, metaphorical language. What captivates me, unlike others, this suggests Abbas has a unique captivating equality, a light for the darkness, he is for the tent. This paints Abbas as guiding, illuminating figure, O oh, moon in the sky, descended with compassionate this likeness, Abbas, to moon, associated with the beauty, sincerity, and divine favor. Reverences and venerations is another point. Glory be to the one who is seen in every situation. This expresses a reverent attitude towards the divine source of Al-Abbas leadership. The Euphrates has spoken, you are the river. Galil Furat, Intan Nahar. This is just to show the uh, ability to give life to all. This is the ability of Al Abbas, just like uh, life giving, just like the river. Emotional language, Abbas, has made me delirious, more beautiful than a vision. This conveys the speaker's intense admiration and almost ecstatic response to Abbas. Oh, paradise of feelings. You have spoken to the people. This romanticizes Abbas as a source of a profound emotional, emotional and spiritual connections. So these are just the opening lines of the uh, poem. When we get uh, co going uh, on uh, in the uh, whole, poem, we uh, find that this poem is very emotional, and this comes in accordance with my colleague's uh, paper, which emphasizes the emotional effects of the uh, speech that used by the leaders. So the poet himself uses the emotional effects on the people just to keep their attention to the leaders, to the models that he wants them to, f to follow. So this aspect is very important, and I find this is uh, the best example that we want to uh, shed light on throughout our academic works. Why? Because as my dear colleagues, Dr. Uh, Haider said, that 
in the age of formula and numbers, we need evidences just to say that our prophet, our uh, the followers of our prophets and Ahlul Bayt as the whole is the best example to follow. And I think this is the uh, cause behind holding such a conferences. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Lecturer Asil Al Tamimi and Assistant Lecturer Zainab Ayad Al Zubaydi from the College of Education for Human Sciences, English Department, Babylon University from Iraq. And they will talk ab about the uh, linguistic aspects of uh, Al Sadiq uh, debates in their paper entitled A Critical Stylistic Analysis of Implicit negation in Al-Imam Al-Sadiq's debate. So, welcome. My thanks to Almighty Allah to giving power in complete this uh, work. Uh, then I would like to express my thanks for, uh, or specifically for Dr. Haider for giving this opportunity in participating in this out outstanding events. So, um, I'm Dr. Asir from uh, University of Papillon, College of Education for Human Sciences, with the co-author, um, Assist Lecturer Zainab Ayad. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce my uh, paper, which is uh, entitled, A Critical Statistic Analysis of Implicit Negation in, in Imam, Imam Sadiq's Debate. Uh, this paper is talk about the, uh, the debate between Al Imam al Sadiq and the unbeliever, which is uh, who's called Al Zandir, about the uh, at Tawheed. So, uh, the field of this study is a critical stylistics, is the follow up response to the raise of a critical discourse analysis as an increasingly influential approach to language ideology. So, the aim behind using this field is to uncover the hidden ideologies of the unbeliever uh, from, uh, for Imam al-Sadiq be upon him uh, by using different implicit negation or impl uh, different verbs of implicit negation in order to uncover the hidden ideologies behind uh, uh, this debate. So Jeffrey is as a model of this. Dr. Asid Yes. Uh, ladies, keep it quiet, please. Kemal Dr. Asid Yes. Uh, so, the aim behind using uh, this field is to uncover the hidden ideologies and to, uh, to find the, we can say, the hidden ideologies of the text by using criticality and different set of tools. Uh, Jeffries uses different uh, tools in order to know the hidden ideologies and she said that every word is an ideology. So the aim or the principal concern of the current study is to discuss the, the implicit negation in an Imam Sadiq debate by using different lexical uh, items just like uh, verbs or adjectives or nouns. So the main uh, implicit negations, uh, verbs just like prohibition, doubt, denial, impossibility, and so on. So the fundamental aim of this study is to depict the ideologies of these items that are placed in accordance with the awareness that different groups of items display when investigating these ideologies. So we have different questions. Uh, the main question we can say, what are the main tools of a critical stylistic uh, utilized in the Imam Sadiq debate? And the, uh, the second question, how can implicit negation affect the ideologies in Imam Sadiq's debate? The last question, which are the most frequent implicit negation, uh, trigger and lexical item resorted by Imam Sadiq's debate? So we have the, the main concern, which is critical stylistics. According to Jeffries, she says that or clarifies that the most significant uh, issues that is that language can carry different ideologies, either explicitly or implicitly. The main tools that uh, we have uh, used, naming and describing, uh, negating, assuming and applying. Uh, according to Jeffries, there are different uh, tools, but the study is limited to these tools, naming, describing, negating, assuming and applying. So, Ideology as a term is used explicitly or implicitly according to Jeffries. 
uh, ideology is language is basic instrument through which ideology is transmitted and reproduced. Or we can say it is a mental framework which is reproduced or communicated. So we have different triggers of implicit negation. So we use application, doubt, avoidance, prohibition, accusation, impossibility, and lying. These are the main triggers of implicit negation, which are considered as the main ideologies that are reflected by Imam Sadiq uh, debates or speech. And also we have the main model uh, of this study. Uh, this model is constructed according to the debates between Al Imam al Sadiq and Al Zindiq. Now, the chance for uh, my colleague or the co author, uh, Assist Lecturer Zainab Ayad. Thank you. You are welcome. So, uh, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all and to thank you for. Uh, uh, especially Dr. Haider al-Musawi for giving us this opportunity to participate in this outstanding event. So, uh, I'll complete with the model of analysis. Um, this is an illustration of the model of analysis. Um, uh, it is an eclectic model, of course, uh, from Jeffries uh, 2010 and Espinal and Depres uh, 20. 2020. So, throughout the surveillance, surveillance, sorry, of the use of implicit negation in religious texts, in particular Imam Sadiq's debates, the researchers find that implicit negation constitutes a critical <laughs> stylistic device ideologically employed with the aid of three major tools. These are illustrated in the model. These are naming, inscribing, assuming, and implying, and <laughs> negating. These tools work hand in hand with implicit negation triggers. There are seven. Doubt, avoidance, prohibition, accusation, impossibility, lying, and obligation. So, regarding the data analysis, the current study is concerned with investigating um, the debate between, we have one debate between Al Imam Al Sadiq, peace be upon him, and unbeliever Al Zindiq, sorry, it is um, entitled, I mean, the debate is entitled Oneness of Allah, Al Tawheed. So, we have five extracts that are chosen <coughs> from um, this debate. Um, with the aim of identifying the hidden ideologies throughout using negation and different tools of critical stylistics. I mean the three tools. So um, since we have no time, so uh, we've chosen only one extract to display in this uh, PowerPoint. So here we have the Arabic text and, the, and then we have the translated one. Um, here we have the three tools of analysis, the, the three tools, the three cr uh, critical story stylistic tools, naming and scribing, assuming and implying, and negating to work in this text. Then we have results uh, and discussion regarding the uh, results. The analysis of implicit negation and the selected five extracts from the debate between Al Imam Sadiq and the unbeliever reveals the following findings. So, regarding or concerning the triggers, implicit, sorry, obligation um, is employed more frequently uh, than the other triggers, as it has the, a, a percentage of 33.3 percent. As for the remaining um, triggers, the analysis indicates that doubt and prohibition have the second percentage and then we have impossibility and lying and then we have avoidance and accusation for the last um, ones. With regard to the three tools of critical stylistics, it appears that the tool of negating is employed more frequently than the other two as it uh, has the highest or as it records the highest percentage. And in the assuming and implying tool, we have logical presupposition, which records the highest percentage, rather than existential presupposition. Have you finished? Or you yes. Yes. Uh, just okay. one or two. One minutes. minute. 
Yeah. Here we have the table that illustrates the, uh, the results. And we have two figures, figure one and figure two. And then we have conclusions. So based on the results and findings, we have uh, more than one conclusion. The first one is that Al-Imam Sadiq utilized different critical tools. Uh, we have three, naming, inscribing, assuming, and implying, and gating. So the first hypothesis is verified, of course. The second uh, conclusion is related to the uh, second hypothesis. So to deal with the implied meaning, Al-Imam Sadiq employs an number of triggers. And um, the... Uh, trigger uh, obligation, it records the highest percentage. So regarding the lexical items that are used to uh, imply negation, verbs uh, record the highest percentage rather than the other lexical items, nouns, ver uh, nouns adjectives, adverbs, and so on. Yes, thank you for us. For thank you so much, Ms. Uh, thank you so much. Now let me ask lecturer Asim Mahdi Al-Hilali to come to the platform to present his paper on translation assessments of the Ahlul Bayt purification verse in the Holy Quran. My research paper is entitled uh, Translation Assessment of the Ahlul Bayt Purification Verse. I appear in the Holy Quran into English. Uh, the contents of the presentation involves the following. Introduction, historical context of Ayat al-Tathir, methodology, analysis of the translation, implications and interpretations, and finally, the conclusion. I begin with the abstract. As you know, the purification verse of the Ahlul Bayt, literally people of the house, of the Prophet's house in the, in the glorious Quran, has enjoyed extraordinarily significant importance in both the doctrine and the jurisprudence of Islamic faith. This verse, also known as the Ayat at tathir has received different interpretations and translations across different linguistic and cultural contexts. <laughs> the present study attempts to carry out a comprehensive evaluation of the translations of the ayat purifying the Ahlul Bayt in the Holy Quran. Several English translations of the ayat are analyzed in terms of their religious interpretation, linguistic accuracy, cultural meanings, and theological implications. By examining the English uh, translations of this ayah, the research endeavors to explicate the semantic value and interpretive arguments deep rooted in rendering, <coughs> in rendering the meaning of this important Quranic ayah. Moreover, the effect of various translation approaches on the understanding and interpretation of the ayah within the various societies all over the world will be explored alike in order to provide uh, a clearer understanding of the ayah. In the introduction, it's stated that the purification ayah of the Ahlul Bayt in the Holy Quran, also known as Ayat Tathir, is a central tenet within Shia Islam, signifying the purity and sanctity of the Prophet Muhammad's household. This ayah found in Surah Al-Ahzab 33, 33, has been subject to various interpretations and translations reflecting the diversity of Islamic scholarship and linguistic context. The purpose of the research paper is to critically assess different translations of the Ahlul Bayt purification ayah, examining their linguistic fidelity, cultural resonance, and theological implications.
Uh, as for the historical context of Ayat al-Tathir, it's stated that to understand the significance of the Ahlul Bayt purification ayah, it's essential to delve into its historical context within early Islamic history. The ayah was revealed during the event of the Muwahala, where the Prophet Muhammad engaged in a spiritual challenge with the Christians of Najran. The inclusion of his family, particularly Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, in the Mubahala emphasizes their elevated status within Islam and underscores their spiritual purity. This research paper employs a comparative analysis approach to evaluate translations of the Ahlul Bayt purification ayah. Three translations into English will be examined where the focus is on prominent Quranic translators, uh, including Abdullah Yusuf Ali, Muhammad Asad, and Marmaduke Pekthel. The assessment will consider linguistic accuracy, semantic nuances, and theological interpretations. As for the analysis of translations, as I said earlier, uh, the, 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 there are three translations included in the research or in the analysis. The first one is Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translation. Abdullah Yusuf Ali translates Ayat al tathir as follows. Allah doth, doth only will to keep away the uncleanness from you, O people of the household, and to purify you, a thorough purification. Ali, 2000, page 918. Ali's translation highlights moral immunity and purification for the Ahlul Bayt, foregrounding their, sp their spiritual interpretation of the ayah rather than providing a physical interpretation. <coughs> Muhammad Asad's translation, uh, on the other hand, opts to offer a nuanced interpretation of Tathir Ayah, and his translation reads as follows. God desires but to remove all uncleanness from you, or you members of the Prophet's household, and to purify you to utmost purity. Uh, Asad, 2000, 2003, page 643. Here, what's emphasized by Asad is the sp spiritual purity of Ahlul Bayt, foregrounding their dignified status within the nation of Islam. Yet his, yet his translation is not literal, as the case should be, when rendering ambiguous or controversial expressions and texts where preserving the meaning of the original is the safe side that translators should take to avoid bias to a specific interpretation or interpretations. Uh, the third translation is by Marmaduke Pictel, uh, and he presents a more literal rendering of the ayah, where he says, where he states, Allah's wish is but to remove any cleanness far from you, O folk of the household, and cleanse you with a thorough cleansing. Pixel 2001, page 408. Pixel's translation includes a clear drawback in selecting the verb cleanse for translating the Arabic verb yutahir, as the verb cleans suggests that the physical aspect is intended, not the spiritual one. Yet on the whole, Pictel's translation seems the most neutral, where no intervention is made, literal translation is used, and fo formal correspondence is maintained. Thus, target language audience are granted the chance to understand the original form structure and content as far as possible, 
and are left the free choice to find out the most appropriate interpretation by themselves. As for the implications and interpretations, the analysis of the translations reveals divergent interpretations of the Ahlul Bayt purification ayah, ranging from spiritual purification to physical cleansing. These vari variations underscore the complexity of Quranic translation and its effect on theological understanding within Islamic communities. Furthermore, the differing, the, the differing interpretation of Ayat al-Tathir highlights the theological distinctions uh, between Sunni and Shia Islam regarding the status and the role of the Prophet's family. As for the conclusion, it states that the translation assessment of the Ahlul Bayt purification conducting a comparative analysis of the selected translations, the study underscores that since the ayah is a controversial one among the den denominations of Islam, faithfulness to the source language through adhering to literalness, maintaining formal correspondence between the source language and the target language, uh, and selecting the closest tar target language equivalents in translation by Quran translators is the recipe for dealing with the controversial eyes of the Holy Quran. This is so because it's the most likely decision for preserving both the form and the content of the source language text and conveying the original message to the target language audience with, without bias, intervention, or change. By deepening our understanding of this ayah, we gain insight into the spiritual significance of the Prophet's household within Islamic tradition. Thank you, Mr. Asma. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Now the turn is uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Maryam uh, Safara and Dr. Samana Saadat Sadidpur. Uh, two researchers from Islamic Republic of Iran, they will talk about the interpretation of spiritual health with emphasis on the narrative of Safina, Hussein, Asra, and Usa. Please, okay, come to the platform. In the name of God. Assalamu alaikum ya sahib al-zaman. Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. Assalamu alaikum ya... Yabna Amir al Mumin Yogamar Bani Hosha. I'm very uh, thankful uh, of uh, Professor Haydar Musavi and his team uh, about uh, manage this conference. Uh, I'm uh, Mariam Safar, researcher about uh, spiritual health uh, and my field in clinical psychology. Uh, my topic is about interpretation of spiritual health with emphasis on the narrative of Safina, Hussein, Asra, and Ausa. Uh, human uh, being uh, from body and soul. Uh, A human being from soul and body, theology and material things, God and soul, good and evil, as well as he gets body diseases and their treatments, is the responsibility of medical science. His mind will also be disturbed, and uh, as a result, he, uh, will in the, in, uh, he will endanger the health of the society in which he lives. Uh, WHO uh, defined the mental health uh, in human and mentioned on uh, some uh, uh, capacity uh, in human uh, if uh, the human has a mental health. Capable and talented and can cope with the natural stresses of life 
work usefully and successfully, participate actively in society. But unfortunately, uh, in uh, right now in the society, uh, especially at the threshold of the 21st century, depression, anxiety, and different values uh, occur in the society. Health in the transcendental culture of Islam as a personal value and the healing of the Quran and the solutions it has expressed to deal with mental pressure and ensure their mental health have received the attention of many mental health researchers. So, uh, if the human soul is characterized by noble qualities, then it will be in the bliss and happiness forever and a virtuous society will be formed. In fact, by highlighting these values and clarifying the, if the difference between values and anti-values, Islam calls people to the right path. The path that is, uh, that is the path of balance and reaching the perfection of humanity, and only the Holy Prophet and the Imams achieved it. It means uh, Islamic spiritual health. Therefore, the main dimension of human health is spiritual health. Uh, health in Islam uh, emphasizes on values, emphasis on two without mistakes, power in life, style, Quran and attract, and comprehensive emphasis on human health. What uh, Islamic spiritual health says? The religion of Islam provides a clear and comprehensive plan for the lifestyle. How does Islam provide the spiritual health of man, Quran and Etrat, during Quran and Etrat, for Etrat, from Etrat, Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Taba Tabai said, most of those who uh, succeed in, succeed, uh, in negating doubts and the king of knowledge downed on them were either reciting the Holy Quran or by appealing to Hazrat Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Qazi Taba Tabai says, it is impossible for a person to reach the position of Matem, uh, Matis, uh, except the road, the path of Sayyid al Shahada, blessing and uh, charities follow from the path of Hazrat Sayyid al Shahada, but the pioneer of this virtue is Hazrat Amar Bani Hashem, alayhi salam. This article wants to show that appealing to Imam Hussein according to Hadith Safina can be one of the best ways to gain a spiritual health and its interpretation. Uh, what is Hadith Safina? The example of uh, Prophet Muhammad says, uh, the example of my family among you is like Nuh's Ark, whose riders are saved and those who disobey them are drowned. <laughs> the example of my family among you is Nuh's Ark, in which everyone who took refuge in was saved, and everyone who stayed behind perished. Uh, narrators of Hadith Safina, uh, such as Abu Zar Ghaffari, Abu Said Khedri, Meghdad, Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, Anas ibn Malik, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Ami, uh, Amir ibn As, and Abu Musa Ash'ari. Hadith Safina shows that the only way to be saved is, the, is uh, to take refuge in the Ahlul Bayt and the role of Prophet's family in guiding the people. Hadith of Safina uh, uh, described that there is, a, uh, there is an analysis of the late Shushtari about the cultural capacity of the history of Ashura and the personality of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Uh, he said that all of them are the light of guidance, all of Ahlul Bayt, but Getting the light from the light of Hussein, peace be upon him, is more and wider. 
all of them, uh, all of Ahlul Bayt are strong uh, shelters, but the way to reach the shelter of Hussein, peace be upon them. It's smoother and easier. Uh, and Kolona Safana Neja Balakin Safina to Jeddi Al Hussein, Ausau and Ausau wa Asra. It's uh, um, sentences uh, from Shushtari. Uh, the first of this sentence um, uh, emphasizes on this Prophet Muhammad and other Ahlul Bayt, but, but uh, Awsa wa Asra is the emphasis that um, uh, Shushtari uh, emphasizes on this. Finding the size of Abu Abdullah's Ark can be understand, understood when it is compared to Nuh's Ark. Nuh Arks did not allow the erring sun to enter but the Ark of Imam Hussein was built to accommodate the sinners and the wrong uh, doors of Muslims and other nations such as Jew and Christian, as well as other religious by appealing to Imam Hussein. Carrying Tabaki. Tabaki is a state in which, per, in which a person makes himself cry when he has uh, no tears, and it is only a form of carrying that the so-called carrying is false. But uh, with this prayer of for Imam Hussein, he then become obligatory for a person and his sins for, uh, for his sins are, are forgiven. This is the guarantee of the speed of saving the sheep of Abu Abdullah. The great, the, the great emphasis uh, uh, of the Imam Hussein alayhi salam on mewing for Imam Hussein, establishing mewing, gathering for him, and considering considering great rewards for him mewing uh, has a purpose. This great goal is to re uh, revive the values for which Imam Hussein stood up and was martyred in the society. To, uh, to review the values uh, enjoying of good, forbidden bad, praying and following the prophet, but, uh, and uh, to visit the whole sharing forgiveness uh, sins as uh, vaccination and help the sinner to have a chance for forgiveness uh, from Allah. Uh, conclusion uh, about Safina Hussein Asra and Ausa. Uh, we can say in conclusion that the spiritual ten, uh, tenderness and spiritual flight of the seekers of the divine past is obtained from the passion and darkness of their appeal to the hymn, which is much faster, more effective, and more durable uh, than other means in this way. Therefore, this is no meaning, this is two meaning, a spiritual health. Deep and pure spiritual health. The uh, kind tears and sighs. And finishes. The kind tears and sighs have been and continue to be with the knowledge of Hazrat Abu Abdullah, fat of uh, revelation and his uh, mystical observation and examination. And this means Hussein's method of knowledge is open to all lovers. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker for the morning uh, session is uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Hassan Al Kaabi. His, his paper uh, is entitled A Pragma Stylistic Study of Imam Ali's Commandment for His Son, Imam Al Hassan. Al Kaabi is an assistant professor uh, from the University of Kufa, College of Arts, Department of Translation. His major is uh, general linguistics, specialized in pragmatics. Uh, he has published more than uh, 25 papers in different uh, local and national uh, journals, uh, authorized and co-authorized five books on various topics in linguistics. Uh, he also supervised and examined more than 30 uh, MA and PhD uh, students. So, Dr. Hassan, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum. I am so happy today to be here in this 
uh, honorable session among guests, the group of sublime researchers, <laughs> my dear professors, Dr. Farid, Dr. Yal, Dr. Abbas, and the other colleagues. Today, I'm going to tackle some kind of topic which is not very new. It's an old new one. Just trying to handle this, because without it, I can move. Oh, OK. I found it. OK, the topic is a Brahman stylistic study of Imam Ali's, peace be upon him, commandment to his son, Imam al-Hassan. Uh, the topic, uh, as the title says, or as the title illustrates, is about, you know, the pragma stylistic approach of studying this important or a highly elevated masterpiece of commandment, which is delivered by Imam Ali, alayhi salam, to his sons and companions. Uh, the importance of this approach is that uh, it tries to fill the gap, which is not, you know, bridged by other researchers in this regard. Most of the researches that have been done so far are done in terms of, you know, literary studies rather than, you know, pragmatics or linguistics in general and pragmatics and stylistics in particular. So here I try to, you know, to shed light on the eloquent masterpieces that have been, you know, paid sublime praise and vast attention from other scholars, but from this perspective. Concerning the perspective itself, uh, it tries, as I said, it tries to, you know, to shed light from, you know, a pragmatic stylistic perspective on the excellent instances or pieces of ingenuity which is delivered by Imam Ali. I mean the commandment which is delivered to his son, Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, and which is considered as one of the highly praised works of classical Arabian and Islamic sublime literature. Uh, here again, I focused on the pragmatic and the stylistic components of the, you know, the, of, uh, out of which the, this holy piece, which echoes the Holy Quran, is composed of. Uh, may, mainly, I focused on the pragmatic stylistic strategies which are employed in performing such, you know, such a highly elevated piece of, okay, commandment. The theoretical framework... I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, as I said, we have pragma stylistics. Of course, we know pragmatics. There is no need to say so many things about pragmatics. But in, in terms of pragmatics in relation to literature, here comes the role of stylistics. That's why we have this hybrid. Someone would ask simply, why this hybrid or this some kind of combination between you know, pragmatics and stylistics? Uh, the question is answered in this. Literary pragmatics, or the pragmatics which is concerned with literature, tries to approach literary text in their use of communicative interaction. So it concentrates on the linguistic role played by the, the text and accordance with the stylistic matters, contextualized stylistics, in fact. Okay. Uh, as Daskal says, uh, the utilization of pragmatics investigation in literary classical discourse is indispensable. Okay? Also, concerning stylistics, stylistics tries to make some kind of interpretation or uncovering of the aims of the literary works. Again, that's why I have combined pragmatics and stylistics. So we come to the definition of the pragma stylistics. It is the application of theories and methodologies of pragmatics to the study of the concept of style and language. And this is the basic importance. So one would ask, again, what is the importance of applying this approach to this kind of commandment? In fact, this tries to, you know, to configure the importance and the resemblance between the Imam Ali's commandments and the Holy Quranic verses. Okay? So in the end, in the end, I will give you some conclusions that would resemble or that would try to compare Imam Ali's 
sayings and okay, uh, t- uh, the traditions which is narrated by Imam Ali to Imam Hassan in a way that is echoing the whole Quran. Of course, the major aim of this study, I won't uh, mention all, the whole aims, only the major aims is the identifying the most significant pragma stylistic strategies utilized by Imam Ali here in delivering this renowned text and showing these strategies, how have been used in this, in relation to rhetoric. In terms of the aims, the hypothesis, the main hypothesis is that it represents a rich resource for linguistic and other types of scientific studies due to the Quranic knowledge. And this is the basic I said. Uh, I have found through researching uh, the commandment and analyzing it by means of the model, the model of the analysis. Uh, the model of analysis is some kind of eclectic one. It is, uh, you know, a combination of major two other models, Niazi and Gotham's 2010 and Al Hindaw and Al Cruz model 2012. Uh, these two models, uh, you know, combine the major tools of analysis, including the following. Okay, this is the model. The model is, has, or uh, it contains at least three basic, okay, three basic parts or three basic stages. First, the initiation. In the initiation, we have the speech art, the conversational literature, diaxis, synonymy, and parallelism. When we move, when Imam Ali moves with the text, uh, maintaining the, the, the ideas which are mentioned or which are referred to in the text, comes through Bragman rhetorical tropes. Of course, Bragman rhetorical tropes are so important and they play a major role in, you know, in, you know, maintaining and alleviating the whole text. And really I have found that the most interesting part is that the, the use of the pragma rhetorical tropes, I mean the emphatic tropes, rhetorical questions, understatement, overstatement, and the other you know, means are highly echoing the Quranic verses. You see, when it comes to Quranic verse, it highly echoes the Quranic verse. Then we have the structural cohesive devices and synonymy. Finally, the termination or the ending of this stage or this commandment ends with again so we begin with the speech acts and we end with the same thing which with the speech acts and also with synonyms uh, interestingly and imam ali's uh, commandment is you know swarms with uh, synonyms so many kinds of synonyms near synonyms highly elevated ones uh, uh, besides the synonyms i have also found or the study has fo- has reached the conclusion that, that the, not only the synonyms, it is the collocation within the synonyms itself. When synonyms are used, it, they are used in a collocation of range or within the collocation, collocation range. Uh, I have this piece of analysis. Can you, sorry to interrupt Dr. Hassan, just one example and then you move to your conclusion? Uh, yes, I would move to the conclusion. Uh, only this example. Okay. Uh, we begin with Min al Walid al Fan al Muqarri al Zaman al Mudbir al Umr. I'm sorry to say this. Uh, the translation is missed here. I have the translation. Okay. Uh, concerning the conclusions. Okay. On, on the basis of the analysis and what I have done through the analysis, we, we have reached or it has been concluded that directive and assertive speech act strategies are the most common pragmatic strategies which are highly used with high density. And this is why, they aren't, of course, they are intermixed with lexical cohesive devices intentionally. This is done to consolidate the text and give it precision and highly intricate structure, okay? Of course, this reflects the elevated style and creativity of Imam Ali's peace be upon him, uh, which is beyond the human creation. According to Abu uh, Ibn Abi al-Hadid, he says this is beyond the human beings and, okay, and uh, underneath the, the Quranic verse, okay? So uh, the creativity here in mixing these stylistic and pragmatic devices in order to give one piece, one solid piece, to create some kind of creative ideas and meanings, okay? Of course, to deeply affect the addressee and the reader. 
Also, there is a very interesting uh, okay, conclusion is that the precision and the discursal macro and micro unity results from another sig significant linguistic tool, that is the stylistic devices. So the stylistic devices, the repetition, the synonyms, are all used just to show us one thing, which is, again, the influence of the Holy Quran on the Imam Ali's peace be upon him. In the end, I thank you for your listening, and I hope you all the best. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan, for uh, this uh, uh, presentation. And we have reached to uh, the last stop of our first morning journey. And I'd like to ask the chairman to wrap up the ideas that have been discussed uh, in uh, this session. And then we will allocate five minutes for questions to be directed to uh, the researchers. So, Dr. Well, thank you very much. Now that we came to the end of the session, let me uh, let us uh, wrap up okay, by re-expressing our thanks and heartfelt gratitude to all our uh, attendees and guests, uh, speakers and participants okay, for their contributions, and to the conference okay, team led by Professor Haidar Ghazi al Musawi. The presentations varied in their topics and approaches. Um, some talked about uh, tackled linguistic, uh, rhetorical, stylistic aspects and features of imams' okay, speeches and their okay, eloquence. Others okay, tackled uh, the educational and maybe okay, myth methodical and methodological, of course, effects of imams' okay, speeches on people. Still others investigated the analogy or symmetrical okay, relationship between okay, past and present, uh, okay, dichotomy of quietism and activism, the contemporary okay, division or dichotomy between Iraqi quiet okay, merja'iyya, seemingly Iraqi quiet okay, merja'iyya, and uh, Irani or uh, activist uh, revolutionary merja'iyya and leaders. As okay, Professor uh, Sharbrod okay, confirmed, this is only a problematic reading and maybe okay, context dependent. So Al Marja'iyya in Najaf al Ashraf in Iraq is activist when okay, time requires to be. So uh, this okay, prudent or wise okay, de decision is left okay, to the grand okay, clergy, Al Marja'iyya Al Ulya, okay, to take. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. We have five minutes uh, for questions. So please, if you have uh, any question, yes, sir, please. Mr. Ali Al Hakim. Mr. Ali Al Hakim. Bismillah ar Rahman Rahim. Ali Al Hakim, Ustad Jamia, Al Hawzam in London. Um, I'm just going to uh, ask two questions, if you allow me, for our first two speakers. Okay. Um, first, Dr. Mr. Oliver, Oliver uh, Scarbrot, as well as uh, Dr. Marcos. Um, the idea that he has presented, I'm referring now to the first speaker. He's now in an interview, so he can't hear you. So move to the second question with the Dr. Marcus, yeah, and then we will go back to Mr. Oliver. Great. Yes. Um, to the second speaker, I appreciate your um, contribution. It was a useful uh, lecture, specifically referring to tolerance and human rights. Um, but the the very title of of your research is. Uh, intriguing and uh, um, I, I didn't find that many elements in details that reflects how Muslims should behave themselves in Europe. Specifically, there is a, a high and rising uh, um, tendency of Islamophobia in, in Europe. I know Germans are very tolerant, that's, that's correct. Uh, comparing to English, they are as well good. Um, but at the same time, I do remember sometimes we were traveling to Germany, you know, they were saying, you know, Ausländer raus, you know. So, so you, you want examples uh, I or wanted, the aspects? I wanted more details, details about how they should behave, as well as, as the exam examples you have mentioned is not related to human rights. As Imam Ali was 
um, like you know, traveling and riding, and somebody were following after him. This thank you, thank you. To the moral aspects, not to the human rights. It's just about like. Thank you, Mr. Ali. Thank you very much. Uh, so, no, I feel, refer to the first speaker. Uh, he's not here yet, Dr. Oliver. Let no. we answer your first question, second question, and we will go back to the first. So, Dr. Marcus, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to work on the practical ways to um, uh, to find our way in uh, uh, in Western societies. And of course, ten minutes is very uh, a small uh, time to explain everything. I hope you will find it uh, more in my article. Yeah, uh, and the uh, Ausländer raus is uh, a new uh, approach uh, from. Uh, not very new, but uh, in this um, dim dimension, it's uh, it's new in Germany, and um, many uh, personalities um, um, uh, are in the opposite of this uh, um, sentence, for example. And yes, we have problems in Germany, but we uh, try to solve it. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very so, much. The, the, the second Mr. Oliver, to yes, the first please. speaker, yes. I, appro I appreciate your research. It was uh, useful. Um, but um, there are two similarities, and I, I found that they were not successful. It's about the imams who are, in, according to the, in accordance to the Shia, I believe that they are ma'asum, ma'asum al-arba'ata'asha, there are only 14 purified. Referring to the fuqaha, they are not masum, um, and therefore drawing the similarity is just a form of reflection. So that's fine, but not literally following exactly the same example. The second one is about it is about the uh, the same time phrase. Like um, you refer to Al Khoui and Sistani, then compared it to Iran. I wonder, and here is the crucial crux, like. Uh, when we talk about the same time phrase, you know, Imam al Hussein was alive during the time of Al Hassan, but he hasn't done anything. He has accepted the capitulation and he kept quiet as well. This doesn't mean that he was a quietist. That was the request, the 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 the, uh, the means of the time, the how should one behave and react. But in the case of Iraq, you refer to Sayyid al khoui you didn't refer to Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al-Sad. And then we have quite different approaches. And there you go. It is related to what we call it, either the broader sense of Wulayat al-Faqih or the very limited one of Wulayat al-Faqih. While Sayyid Muhammad Bakr al-Sad believe in that wider sense of Wulayat al-Faqih, but uh, the more classical tradition of Fuqaha, are um, more into limited wilayat al faqih Probably that is the reason, not because they are quietists or revolutionaries. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Ali. Now, is it a comment or you want to answer something? So you are objecting, just, or clarifying. Okay, this is a point that you can sure. discuss later no, my on. My pleasure, and again, it's yes. great to, to see Sheikh Hakim again. You know, we've met each other a lot in London, and I've learned and benefited a lot from from his scholarship and from his uh, uh, knowledge. No, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, by by drawing this parallel, I'm not suggesting that uh, the the imams at the fuqaha are at the same ontological status. Um, of course, they are completely different. Uh, but of course, there is this concept of aniyama aniyaba al ama. You know, the sort of general deputyship and a similar functional role. So in terms of the leadership for the community, um, they sort of step on behalf of the imams with all the limitations and you know, the responsibility that this um, contains. With regards to your second point, yes, absolutely. This is uh, um, something that needs more research because I think um, many research in the West do not necessarily understand the, the, the broad meaning of Wailat al Faqih. They think, okay, somebody is in support of Wailat al Faqih. This is, you know, as you know, Imam Khomeini has uh, um, um, understood it and defined it. But as you point out, you know, within uh, you know, the, 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 the Marja'iyah, among the ulama, you know, there's a, quite a range of different views on the extent and the scope um, of Wailat al Faqih. At the same time, I would argue, and you're right, this of course informs different stances 
do I engage in a revolt? Do I try to um, to uh, find you know a, a non-confrontational relationship? At the same time, I would argue that even in the most restrictive understanding of Wallat al-Faqih, there is a political dimension behind it. Because, you know, his Bidal Islam is a political role. And, I mean, another concept that I, I don't mention, but I think is equally important, is you know, the notion of the responsibility of the Fuqaha for al-Umur al hisbiya you know, the, you know, to, it's difficult, again, to translate it into English, you know, affairs of the marketplace. I don't think it's a good translation. It's about maintaining public morality. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Oliver. Yeah. I think you can complete your yeah. argument on the lunch so that we can raise new points that could be discussed in the next conference for the next year. Uh, we have two minutes or less if you have any other question for our local or international uh, researchers or speakers. Here, lady with glasses. Uh, first of all, thank you, Salah, for having us today. My question is for Ms. Maha. Dr. Maha, is she here? Dr. Maha? Yes. Um, yeah, my question is like, why you choose the word uh, dignity and not bride? And when you translate it in Arabic, you choose tafakhur and not karama. So I was so curious about that. And then, like, as we know that the imam is not, not of their manners to have like such a thing, tafakhur. He is more likely to be honored to say his uh, family and bring them uh, in the context. So I was so shocked that you chose uh, with the word tafakhur and not bride or honored. Thank you. So yes, Dr. Maha, you, can you justify your use of the word dignity and your translation to dignity into tafakhur al -kad? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Well, um, to be honest, uh, the first thing we did when we wrote this uh, research, uh, when we co-authored this paper, um, the word was chosen first in Arabic, tafakhar. Okay, and then we translated it, and, that, and th this is where the problem occurred. Should we translate it into dignity, pride, self-esteem, etc.? But why the choice of tafakhar? I, I don't know why the word itself carries a, a negative connotation, uh, because in fact, uh, the speech itself, uh, if you go back to the Arabic um, version, it has the word tafakhar in it twice, or fakhar. Um, I think once mentioned uh, during um, Im Imam al Hussein's um, uh, uh, during uh, the battle that he that he was proud um, uh, when he walked out f to battle. And, and uh, another, um, i sorry, but I can't remember the exact um, uh, instance, but the word itself, again, was mentioned in the speech. And um, we're looking at the word um, as, um, uh, as, a, as an emotional appeal to the audience. He's not using a uh, tafakhar uh, or, as, as we have translated, his dignity and pride uh, um, uh, as a form of boasting, or, or maybe um, in a negative in a negative way, it's actually used um, uh, as a strengthening. Because if if you remember this situation, or if you look at the contextual factors, Al Imam Sajjad alayhi salam was in a very difficult position. He was cuffed, he was chained, he was humiliated in front of everyone. And I think being proud of his lineage and heritage at that exact thank you, moment is what turned everything thank around. Thank you very much, Dr. Maha. Thank you I for... I hope that answers your question. Thanks thank a lot. Thanks a lot. So uh, we end uh, the uh, question and answer session and invite the host to say the final or the closing uh, word for this, uh, this morning session. So at the end of the morning session, I'd like to thank chairman, convener, and researchers uh, for their participations. And now you are cordially invited to have your lunch at Al-Madif. Thank you so much. <laughs>